This is the listening test for levels from 3 to 5 of the Vietnam 6 level language proficiency test. There are three parts to the test. You will hear each part once. For each part of the test, there will be time for you to look through the questions and time for you to check your answers. Write your answers on the question paper. You will have five minutes at the end of the test to transfer your answers onto the answer sheet. The recording will now be stopped. Please ask any question now, because you must not speak during the test. Part 2. Directions. In this part, you will hear three conversations. The conversations will not be repeated. There are four questions for each conversation. For each question, Choose the right answer, A, B, C, or D. Then on the answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Questions 9 to 12. Listen to the discussion between two exchange students, Martha and Peter. First, you have some time to look at questions 9 to 12. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 9 to 12. I'm sure that's effective. So, we've just talked about learning English. Do you learn any other languages in the same way? Actually, I thought about that question before, and I started studying Japanese a few years ago. But my Japanese learning is very different from my English learning. Hmm, how is it different? Well... The little bit of Japanese that I've learned, I've learned through listening mostly and having to speak or, you know, helping myself in daily situations. I haven't been able to master enough kanji and Japanese symbols to be able to read it well or to write it well at all. How about you? I learned Spanish in a similar way to how I learned English. That is, I did study, but I didn't think of it as studying. It was fun for me, and then. Once I reached a certain level, then I went to Spain to practice. But with Japanese, I haven't reached that level yet. Doesn't work anymore, so yeah, I've been trying to learn Japanese for a few years, but I think my brain has just become lazy. It's interesting. Maybe our brains tackle every language in a different way. I don't know. Maybe so. Do you think age matters for language learning? I would like to say no, but I think there are different factors. So, surely, when you're young, you learn faster. And I think especially because there's nothing else that's occupying your mind. You're just studying. Maybe you go to high school or even university, so it's easy to take on another subject. So, age might have something to do with it. But I have this old friend who retired and then started studying French successfully. So I think it has a lot to do with your motivation, maybe. Your interests, maybe? That's right. I was just going to say maybe more so than age. Yeah, maybe when you're young you might be more eager to learn, but if you have the same kind of motivation when you're older, then why not? Questions 13 to 16. Listen to the conversation between Emma, the tourist, and Felipe, a local person from Ecuador. First, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 16.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 13 to 16. Felipe, you have been to the Galapagos Islands? No. But you lived in Ecuador, right? Yes. Well, you know the problem is that travelling to the Galapagos is really expensive for us. What do you mean for us? Is it expensive for Ecuadorians? Yeah, for nationals. For people who live in Ecuador, it's quite expensive because, you know, since the Galapagos attracts so many tourists every day, hotels and food and travel are so dear. So, you know, we cannot travel there because we can't afford it. But tourists, international tourists, can afford it to go. That's weird. I had the idea that Galapagos is part of Ecuador, so I thought a lot of Ecuadorians would go there. So, who goes to the Galapagos Islands? Well, actually there's, you know, one out of ten Ecuadorians, maybe, might have travelled to the Galapagos. But why do you think it's so expensive to travel there? Well, because, as I just mentioned, thousands of tourists go there, and the islands can't support so many tourists every day. Let's suppose that if prices were really low, then more and more people would go there. And there might be environmental problems or just pollution. And you know, those kinds of issues. So people in the Galapagos, their strategy has been to raise prices so that fewer visitors can go there and the environment isn't jeopardized. Mm, that is true. I guess that makes sense. But being from Ecuador and not being able to see your own country, it doesn't make so much sense. I wonder how that can be solved. Well... I don't really know, but maybe we have other options. We can travel to the Amazon region, which is maybe the same, as beautiful as the Galapagos, but you can travel to the highlands. Ecuador is a quite beautiful country. It's not only about the Galapagos. It's also about the different regions, the people, the food and the culture. Maybe the government should do something because people in Ecuador want to travel to the Galapagos but it's really sad that we can't. It is quite sad. Actually, I believe Ecuadorians should have more rights than the tourists to go to the Galapagos. Yep, we should have more rights, but sadly we don't. So yeah, something should be done, maybe. Hopefully something will change. Yep, I hope so too. Questions 17 to 20. Listen to the conversation between Todd and Katya. First, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. So, Katya, you were talking about how you had an internship and how you actually made the transition from university to the working world and an internship, and now you've actually gone back to the university world. What struck you as the biggest difference having to go to the real world, the working world from the university? Well, the biggest difference, and something that I felt right away, was the responsibility that you have when you're working for somebody else. When you're a student, you're only responsible for yourself, you know, making the deadlines and doing the work, and nobody else is dependent on you. When you're working, there are people depending on you, so the responsibility part was the biggest difference. Was there anything you thought uh, you maybe lacked that you wish you had prepared yourself more for at university, for example, computer skills or writing skills or anything like that? I think presenting skills. Presenting skills and also technical words that I needed, like, I wasn't prepared for that. Can you give an example of some technical words? Well, I learned technical words in English, for example, like, jurisdiction. But I didn't know how to say it in Spanish, even though that's my native language. Yes, 
So I guess another big change is at uni, you might have mistakes when you write, but you maybe don't worry about that so much. In the professional world, it has to be perfect, right? You really don't want to make mistakes because that can lead to less confidence in you. But having mistakes is not a big problem. It just reflects how much you can or cannot do. So for students that are just finishing school or will finish school soon, they often have a lot of anxiety and worry about how they will make it in the real world and will they survive in the real world. What advice or tips would you give them? I don't think they should worry that much and enjoy the experience of the transition. Nothing bad will happen regardless, so there's really no reason. It doesn't help to worry. So the only suggestion I would give is just to try your best and to try to find the things that you really want to do. That is...